Welcome. This is configuration management for teams. I'm Tassilo Gröper, and uh, for the next half hour, I'm going to speak in here. I am from the company called Wondrous. We are Wondrous, situated in Basel. So we are a Swiss-based digital agency, design agency. I'm a so-called full-stack developer, whatever this term means. And uh, this talk actually um, is originated by a colleague of mine, our uh, IT team lead, Rainer Friedrich. And uh, unfortunately, he could, could not come, so I'm giving the talk today. What we do is actually heavily inspired by daily business. And uh, because we found out that, of course, uh, we need to have a workflow to safely deploy on production, a workflow to actually maintain more than 20 uh, Drupal projects, Drupal 8 projects uh, in parallel. Of course, there will be other challenges growing. And, of course, we are trying to reduce the onboarding time for every new colleague, for every project I need to check out because I have to check a bug or something like mm, Try to keep it in less than 30 minutes. And, of course, we need to have a clear path for a developer to an unknown or new project. So, um, we are trying to have the good ability of deep learning feature and, uh, to feature in production branches. So. Let's recap what configuration, about the Drupal 8 configuration system and the configuration can, that can be stored in the ver, um, version control system would look like. So, first of all, in Drupal, as you all know, uh, we can do a single or a, a full e export via the UI. So, just if you want to fiddle around a little bit, then you can, you can do this. But uh, the actual way to do this is using the command line, so the normal Drush. Uh, CX uh, config export command. So, but you have to always keep in mind that the site owns the configuration, not the installed module. Meaning, updates to module configuration can only happen to update functions, so called update hooks, which we will hear next about. But you also have to keep in mind that configuration, this kind of configuration we are talking about, is meant for different environments of one single site. It's not for different sites. It's not for so-called multi-site install installation because we will have UUIDs mis mismatching. So different content will generate different UUIDs, and this will not work with different configuration means. And the next thing to actually set some configuration is to actually do this in a override in your settings PHP. So if you have, for example, a local settings PHP, as you can see, up above there is the config variable setting the uh, logging as well as the system performance. And way down, you will also find the config split configuration for production and development. There are two config storages. Of course, we have the active configuration and the so-called sync configuration. The active configuration lives in our database or in a persistent cache like Redis. And we have the sync configuration, which is part of our version control system, mainly Git or whatever uh, version control system you need. So our goal would be to use the configuration as code. And why would we do this? Because if we treat, treat this as code, we are able to change something on the remote by just in deploy. So changing configuration on the remote is actually just like changing configuration on changing code on a remote. And uh, you really have to make yourself clear that uh, produ uh, production configuration is only a temporary thing. So since it only lives in a database, it's not versioned at some point, and it's not replicated in, in a version control system. Thus, we don't have a hist history of code. So we want a history of our code. We can have a look at our code. We can have a look at our commits. And so our configuration, if this configuration is treated as code, can be reverted. And 
of course, you actually have to export your configuration outside of your web route. So um, I think that's quite readable. Um, so we don't normally have this as a, uh, as a root folder in our version control system, put a config folder in there, put a Drupal in there, and default and all that stuff, we export it there. And <laughs> that's actually the hardest thing to do. We need to automate like everything. We need to automate the database updates. We need to automate the configuration import. And in an ideal way of doing so, for example, if you do this on Platform SH, uh, you need to separate between a build step as well as a deploy step. As you can see, in a build step, you actually push, uh, pull all your dependencies with Composer, so PHP will be. Um, well configured. You pull all your NPM node modules. In this case, we use Yarn. And um, write all the nice files we actually need to have our site deployed uh, into the build. And when this build can be deployed, so connected to the database, we actually have to rebuild the cache, update the database, run the database update hooks, and import this very um, configuration we are fetching from the content management system, and then do our entity updates. That would be the, the nice idea. So there are two challenging, challenges actually doing this. First of all, we have to limit ourselves, and that's something really hard to do. At least for me as a developer, I would like to be able to do everything, but uh, limiting the client's capability is something I would like to do because a stable site is actually the site nobody touches. But um, yeah, to be more realistic, the client has to do something on the site. But we have to differentiate what he or she can do. So uh, we first of all have to limit the client to change content only. And what is content? So we have to make uh, uh, realize what is the content on our website. So changing the configuration on a live site and letting others do this may, may have unwanted side effects. First of all, uh, obviously, uh, the live configuration, as I just said, since it's temporarily, temporarily, may be overwritten by the deploy itself. And the config import may also abort due to differences in the live master configuration state. Um, it can also depend on contents. So if there's a custom block, is there's, if there's a custom taxonomy term that's not yet existing or, or uh, not anymore existing in the uh, live database, then we'll have a new UID mismatch and the import simply would stop and, and be aborted. So, and the second thing is web forms. I'm highly for web forms. I really love this module, but in case of configuration and content di uh, difference, this really is a hard nut to crack. So, web forms themselves are configuration entities, but their submissions are not. So, if you try to actually delete via a config configuration update a web form that already has submissions, it will say, mm -mm, computer says no. If the client is allowed to, to create update and uh, create an update web forms, a deploy actually would delete his or her changes, or as I just said, simply be aborted. So there are possible solutions to this challenges, so to speak. They are not real problems, but challenges. And yeah, so part one would be to see if we can automate an import and see what all the changes in production are doing. And the first step would be if you're using something like Acquire Dev Desktop to actually pull the database and export the configuration from there. This may not always be possible. So we also have situations where we actually are not allowed to have the database on our local machines due to sensitive data. Um, there may be some jump hosts in between and an automated fetch can also not be possible. And then the database can be huge if you are not uh, excluding your caches to a different uh, service or something like a database of minimum one gig is fairly usual and um, caching the database uh, clearing the database's caches just before pulling something is also not always the re uh, always the best way to do uh, 
And yeah, we also have the problem with the local uh, development config split versus the prod config. Who of you heard of config split, the conflict split module? Okay, I'm not telling you something new. If anybody's new to this thing, there's also a very nice, I should be a very nice talk to this at this conference as well. So we want to have uh, locally a different setup than uh, on production. So in this local setup, we actually need to import before doing so. There's also the possibility, sec second possibility, to um, set a config read only with the config ignore module. AKA, AKA YOLO mode. Because what will happen, what will happen is you allow changes to certain areas of configuration, for example, web forms, and uh, you white list those. Sounds fairly simple, it's okay. Um, what you're actually doing is you try to ignore some configuration while the import or the export. What will happen is that it's fairly error prone. You will lose track of those changes. So if you change something in the web form, uh, my new web form and so on, uh, you will not track this in your uh, version control system, which is fairly the thing we wanted to do. And so losing track. Second thing is you cannot update those whitelisted configs. Since you are whitelisting them on an export as well as on import, you have to do everything manually on every either stage. So, and update, update hooks, you may be not aware of that they are changing code. And, may, and those changes you also do not track. So if you uh, think of setting up this very website from a uh, default database, you actually have to clone the um, live database again and see if there have been changes or not. So you're also losing track of that. And one very, very annoying thing is, um, I had this realization in a pro project of ours, you actually need to deactivate some UIs. First of all, the views UI. Because you cannot change anything in a views UI when you're ha in a uh, read-only mode for views. And of course, you could do the export as a third uh, possibility via the UI. But this really does not play, uh, play well together with conflict split, and you st it's still a manual task, it is inefficient, thus it's very error prone as well. So we try to come up with a solution, which is fairly simple put, but uh, it took us quite a long, uh, uh, long thing to discuss, because we, uh, we had to address all those pro problems I just mentioned. First of all, let's recap the requirements we wanted to have. We want to have an automated build process on Platform as Age or Mazio or whatsoever. Uh, we want to use the config split module, module and uh, we have to have at least locally a kind of like setup that is on the prod setup. So step one easily would be to export the remote configuration into a private writable file system on the server. And then sync those, those changes to our local server or a local site or a local uh, dev environment via rsync. And step two would be to uh, actually have a certain workflow how to manage your Git repository. First of all, the master branch is only for deploy. So you would not do anything besides a hotfix on the master branch. Second, you use feature and dev branches uh, for continuous development. That's easy. And you would commit those uh, pod configuration, production configuration, into, into the master. So as I just said, you would not use the master as a pure, develop, pure development um, state, but you try to keep the state of the master as equal to the production state as well. Plus, you try to use Git to merge the features into the master branch, which is fairly simple due to the fact that configuration is a YAML file and it really nicely is able to be compared in a diff. And it, that's fairly easy, I think. I think, no, I don't. Um, but we realized that timing is very important at this point because before merging, those features into the master, you need to update 
the master configuration with a prod configuration. And um, you have to heavily make use of automated scripts, as I just said. I'm sorry for the big black screen right now, but that's the more easiest way to do. And if you see the slides, it's also helping. And we slowly go through this. So first of all, we wrote, wrote our own script. And hopefully you could, yeah, it's fairly simple. Uh, it's not very explicable, but if you go through a little bit, then we will see that, um, give it a short one, two, three. So first of all, uh, it's just a script we wrote. It's a uh, shell script. Uh, I started it with Yarn. That's nothing special. The first thing we uh, have to acknowledge is, at the moment, I'm standing at the actual uh, feature branch, which is called front-end in the upper for you right. And um, this feature branch, the working directory, needs to be clean. So uh, that, uh, uh, that, that script would abort if I would ha not, not have a f um, clean feature branch. So first of all, we need to check if the working directory is clean. Then we check out the master branch. Maybe battery is low. I can start going over here. And um, after we checked, the ma uh, checked out the master branch, we can optionally sync the database or file. So the script is um, fairly um, adjustable in this situation. So normally, I don't want to pull always the database to refresh everything I had there. But in this situation, I uh, also want to update the database because I want to show you something. And then um, conflict split. Uh, conflict split part one gets into uh, into play because first of all the conflict split will export the default configuration and second of all uh, ex uh, conflict split will export the production configuration then we will re uh, rsync as I just said this is a uh, temporary folder on the remote server pull this uh, information to our rem uh, from remote to our um, local server and I'm just scrolling down. So after we pull the remote database, uh, pull this information, then we also pull the database and overwrite our local uh, database. Then we, because our master branch has the current state or the last current state of our configuration, can now give us a uh, correct diff difference to the, uh, master, uh, to the master of the remote. And uh, we can finally run our database updates, reapplying our dev split, as you can see. Um, so we have uh, kind, style file, proxy, sys uh, syslog, and for example, Raven will be uninstalled, so installing and unstall uninstalling. Um, and um, in the end, we switch back to our feature branch. And now in our working directory, we have changed files we are able to have a look at and be able to commit. First of all, we started off just having an automated commit of those files, but uh, soon we realized that this would be, um, that this would be a, a counterproductive because I realized that some changes I made got committed, but I did not want to commit, have them committed right away, and thus it really is um, counterproductive. So. Using this, as I just said, since it's a timing, uh, timing sensitive, we have a dirty config, so-called dirty config problem. Because in situation one, and whoa, my slides are going through. And situation one, you just forget about it, as we will just see in a second. Yes. Uh, situation one, you just forget about to actually sync uh, the remote database, and so the master is not up to date. And situation two, you have a critical period during the deploy hooks. Some deploys take take 10 minutes to deploy, five to up to 10 minutes. And the first thing you would try to do is obviously to reduce the build time. This is not always possible. So during this time, there can be changes to the database and you can't do anything about it. And um, so a proposition we still have and uh, the module is up to be created um, needs to be doing the following. So we could do on the one hand, always export the configuration on production when configuration changes. So 
with a service uh, with a um, uh, with what's it called um, with a uh, service listener you could uh, always do a drush export on production into this very temp uh, template folder if anything anything changes or you could easily set a dirty flag on production in whatever variable then uh, before pushing to the uh, production, you actually check this flag with a git hook, for example, and then if this flag is set, you prevent the push to the master or you prevent at least the build uh, until the uh, flag is cleared due to a uh, sync we have just seen. So if I'm actually pulling something and updated this, um, then it, I am able to actually push to the master again. There are still some quirks you have to work out on this point, but that's the actually fastest thing I, we came up with so far, but yet there's not a module for that. So if you have some insights uh, on that, please remind me. And there's of course content depending on configuration or the other way around, config is depending on content. Um, so, as I just said, view filters may depend on taxonomy terms that are not yet existing. Uh, we could have custom blocks that needs to be placed, but uh, the UID changes, of course, on production since it's not already there. So, you have to create content, maybe via an update hook. You could use the default content module to provide some content, or you could also use the structure sync module to export actually terms, uh, custom blocks as configuration. And of course, there is the composer development process, meaning um, that's actually related to the config split, as we just saw. Why are we doing this? So, easily for security reasons and performance, the modules on production and uh, your local environment may have to change. Not all of them, but uh, certain critical ones. For example, development, stage five proxy or coder, and production. Uh, we can also think of CDN, uh, Century, or Fastly. So, in this case, config split comes in and enable, uh, uh, allows you to actually enable and uh, unable um, the configuration or set the configuration locally. So, uh, as we just seen, uh, we actually have our configuration folder. In this configuration folder, we put our Drupal configuration. We have all our default configuration in there. And if we want to have something like dev or prod, we split this. And, uh, keep it in a general folder and only certain modules um, put into those. And yeah, since Drupal does not need those configuration of modules that are not there or yet installed, it's also fine. And with Compose, it's fairly easy. You just put those requ uh, development requirements into a, uh, the required dev in your Composer JSON, and on production, it, those will not be uh, installed. And as we've seen in before, uh, as we have seen before, in the uh, con uh, settings PHP for your remote, you just switch the config split development and production uh, status uh, to false and true. And there you go. So once again, the basic workflow would be to not hear myself too much. The basic workflow, uh, um, of course, the order is important. So, if we have at a thank you very much, um, if we have a quick look at what, what to do with Drush in this case, first of all, we need to need to run the database updates, and then we have to actually imp export the um, uh, updated configuration when we are locally. We push this to our, uh, we push this to our uh, version control system, and. On the server, we actually want to import this configuration. So we drush updb because we need to run the database updates, aka update hooks. And then we can import the configuration we just have in, happen to have in our um, uh, version control system. And f optionally, um, we can run the entity updates. And one last reminder that is also on time. Um, if you want to actually uninstall a module, you have to make sure or you have to uh, realize that this is a two-step process. It's a two-step process because you first have to uninstall the configuration, set the, un uh, the configuration as uninstall. So in your uh, core extensions, this 
a certain module will be removed and uh, you commit only this change, so Drupal can actually run the, hook, the hook uninstall and remove key entry, uh, key value uh, entries from your table. And as a second step, then you do the composer remove and re uh, commit the removed, the smaller uh, files. So Drupal will not greet you with the following module is missing from the file system. That's still a problem, and if you think about that, maybe a de deploy takes six minutes or something like. Um, <laughs> concurrency is also problematic, so you are stuck for like ten minutes and just waiting, and maybe doing another push after two minutes. Yeah, it's kind of strange. So. If you want to have a closer look at uh, the config split, go check out the advanced configuration management with config split. Um, the script I just showed is without warranties, please, uh, for those who uh, love to shell script um, at this very gist I paid, uh, I, I set up there. And you can find the slides at this very URL. I surely need to. Uh, <laughs> I surely do, does not re need to look. I surely do not re need to remind you to the sprints on Friday. And please rate this talk. Thank you very much. I still have like three minutes. May I have some questions? If there are some. If oh, okay. Uh, the question was, what's the strategy for blocks and block placement? Um, yeah, it actually is this uh, manual process of, uh, first of all, allowing the uh, region to be there, maybe if you set it in a region, and then actually to see if this block is a custom module block or is it a custom block by the U created by the UI. And at this point, um, yeah, we do this manually in both situations, which is really not the thing. But um, if it's getting bigger and bigger, therefore are update hooks. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, as uh, if I understood you right, you actually pick up the configuration changes from your live server, right? And you commit them. I mean, uh, how do you know those changes were deliberately done, how do you actually decide to keep them or throw them away? I mean, a lot of the time, there will be some kind of idiot just clicking around, try to change stuff, and they never make kind of change, do the revert changes. And so what I normally do, personally, I throw them away and say, I, they were probably bad. It went um, so having deliberate changes on the production server actually just plainly plays into the system of having one single source of truth. So uh, if we go live, if we are going to production, that means that uh, the developer, even if he's on, uh, only developing with himself or on himself, um, may have the, the configuration all set on his machine and then he can also push it. If the developer uh, starts off with the um, front-end team and the first content management, we d directly change to the master, uh, to the production side as being the single source of truth. So changes need to be, uh, changes on the development, uh, on the production server is always the only source of truth. And changes coming from there need to be there. But, but in, uh, in CVS or Git, or you normally, your commit message will be, why did we do this change? And if you didn't do it, someone else did, and it's just changed, you, you can see it changed, and you can say, well, it was probably good, but how do you know it was, why, why did they actually do it? Basically, because you uh, kind of uh, arranged with the client that um, this part are able to, to change. So if you allow the client to change uh, web forms, uh, then you see that changes in web forms are valid. But this is also a very long topic, so please see me afterwards. And all of you, uh, as you have seen, call us, uh, give us a note, and 
maybe a high five, buy me a beer, something like that, and uh, come and talk to me if you have further questions. Thank you very much.